Okay, everybody ready? This is going to be a five minute talk and 25 slides. <laughs> Get ready. So, I wanted to talk about this thing, like it's blacklist revisited. We have, oh, we have problem of blacklist, like blocking number of IP addresses. So, so this is actually yesterday afternoon. We were blocking 500, roughly 500,000 unique IP addresses. This is, whatever happened here, I had no idea. <laughs> So, uh, but these, these were the graphs. So this is actually about a year of graph where you would see the increase in the IP addresses getting blocked and then we would actually unblock a lot of them, thousands of them, and then we will block. Uh, then Bro would blo start blocking it again. And then this is two year old data, this is four years old data, this is eight years old data. But the idea is that this thing goes like this. So, uh, now, the problem is blocking bad. Badness keeps increasing on internet and there is no surprise on this finding. So how to manage blocking and uh, more so unblocking? Like, can we block, unblock something today, tomorrow, six months down the line? How do we figure it out? So can we identify uh, are blocked IPs coming back or they are just blocked once and gone forever? Can we identify how long the blocks, uh, how long do we block before we unblock? Can we actually keep state forever? Like it would be awesome to know, oh yeah, this IP actually connected to us on May 5th, 1999. It came back again. Uh, so, but the, the good idea here is that you can identify badness quickly. Like instead of waiting for it to connect to 20 machines, you can have it like connect to one machine and you're done. Uh, are these one-time visitors? Can we find how many local IPs did this blacklisted IP touched on? Uh, can you know how long the scan lasted? Does, did it last for one minute? Did it last for six minutes? Uh, what was the last connection? Uh, so what was the frequency of such connections? Was it like 10 times a second? Was it like one a day? So there is all these things. And then there is another problem. The problem is uh, uh, how do you, re like we can re use uh, input framework to read millions and millions of IP addresses, but then you send it to workers. So you, I read 1 million IP addresses. Now it goes to 50 workers. There is 50 million events. And then bro starts crying and hating you. So. <laughs> So how do you deal with this? And actually, 50, 1 million is nothing. I want to do it for 4 billion. And 4 billion, why? Because IP4, V4 has 4 billion addresses. Let's block everything. So, <laughs> and we can do that. We have Bloom filter. We have technology. And we actually have something better. We actually have ability to take the entire Bloom filter and use a worker to manage our process and just, or manage it to worker process and just ship it everywhere. That's what I did. I would take it, uh, take the uh, data, put it in Bloom filter, Construct the Bloom filter when everything is happy, things, there is an end of data event, you ship it to all the workers. If it matches Bloom filter, there is a hit. So here's an alert. Uh, this IP did an ICMP connection. We dropped it. This was all the history and the comments. This was the result, we, like block until. So this is uninitialized because we haven't figured out the logic of when to unblock. So, but this is how the logs look like for this particular IP address. Uh, where is it? This IP address here, uh, we saw the connection first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. This was the starting time, end time. This is actually converted like, okay, how long this has been going on? Five, day, five days, 15 hours, 22 min uh, minutes. Uh, when was the last connection seen? The last connection was 39 minutes ago. But you can actually see the frequency here. This is the number of unique hosts it actually connected to. This is the number of unique connections it made. This is the source of the data. Uh, this is actually the real data too. So. Uh, where you can see all this stuff. So, so this actually gets us pretty good visibility into like how do you do blacklisting and uh, how to scale it to a level where you can actually characterize the badness as well as prioritize blocking, unblocking, detecting like, okay, this, this is gonna be permanent block or not. And I think my five minutes are done. So. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John. I tried my hardest to, to compare with uh, Sheesh and have the same number of slides. I, I, I lost to the master. Um, <laughs> but I, I have a premier dozen slides. So um, my name is John Ziola. I work on this Apache Metron project. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what Bro does in that environment, or how Bro works in that environment. So first of all, what is Metron? I kind of pulled this from the GitHub page. It's a lot of words. So um, really what it summarizes down to is Metron integrates uh, a ton of Hadoop ecosystem technologies in order to use a lot of security data. And what I'm going to talk uh, for the next couple of minutes about is the word, how, how it actually uses them. Uh, it, does, it does Bro data, but it also does you know, Snort, Yaf, PCAP, things like that. 
So um, it has kind of three main components. The first component is parsing and normalization of the logs. Uh, also, I wanted to note, uh, if you guys have been coming around here for a while, I actually heard of this project back when it was at Cisco. It used to be called OpenSOC. Some of you guys might have heard of that. I think it was 2014 they actually presented here, and that's how I first heard about it. Um, anyway, so the first tier is parsing and normalization. So the logs kind of come in here from your bro cluster or from wherever. Uh, they get cleaned up, normalized, and then they move on to the next tier. Uh, a couple of times it's been mentioned the um, the output mo the plugin um, for writing to Kafka. Uh, there we go. Uh, bro package for that is coming soon. I've been working on it. Um, I have a couple requests. Uh, you know, Seth gave me a great lead, and he said, you know, we want we want issues. So, um, so I'm going to complain about my build command because that's way too big of a build command. Um, I opened. I opened a couple of issues on GitHub last night, um, and then I sent this email earlier today, so I'm doing my best job at being persistent with this. <laughs> um, but I have to say that they've been awesome, and so far, I think I already have a solution to this one. Uh, I'm talking with John. He was here earlier. This is being weird. Okay, there we go. Uh, second tier, so it does um, enriching and triaging of the data. So kind of this big chunk right here, it takes in the information, it adds you know additional context, whatever's in, uh, interesting. It does some level of profiling, so it says you know this is an outlier. Uh, does statistical analysis on maybe numerals or things like that. Um, uh, it can maybe tag, like if there's an IP address, tell me what subnet that IP address is in, you know, by integrating with an IPAM or DDI solution. It can do, you know, geo lookups using MaxMind database. It does a whole bunch. It's customizable. You can do whatever you want. Um, that's kind of the theme of the whole platform is it's, it's a platform. Uh, and then it goes to threat intel and threat triage. So, um, you know, integrate with like a taxi feed or something like that. There's a match on this IOC, you know, give it a, you know, triage it a little bit and say that this is, you know, I consider this an 80 out of 100 when this matches. So, it is now an 80, so whenever it gets to the end, which is right here, it pretty much just gets indexed, and then there's a UI, you view it in the UI, and it can kind of prioritize, like, oh, you know, 80 is more than 50, so let's look at the 80s first, and the 90s, and um, when you're at this level, all of this is um, reconfigurable on the fly, um, so you just make changes as you go, and it reprioritizes things based on what you know about your environment. So a couple of key features. So like I said, data streaming, normalization, and cleaning. Uh, it scales super high, so it's Hadoop. So like you know, I have a 50 node. Uh, I have about 50 nodes al allocated to this. You can scale way bigger than that. I think in the talk like a couple years ago, it said something like 1.3 million um, packets per second. You know, it's it can scale up from there since since then. Um, it has some canned and custom streaming enrichments. That's like the you know enrich. This is this is what that subnet is. This is what it means. Geo information, whatever. Um, where are we at here? Uh, thread Intel integration, so taxi feed, and it's good to go. Uh, modeling as a service, so machine learning, uh, pretty cool buzzword. You can, uh, you, so you can actually train a model um, in the cluster, and whenever you have a model, you can apply that model in streaming for each message that comes by, and, and use that to say, like, you know, to do clustering or categorization or whatever you want to do. Uh, it leverages uh, a component called the profiler, which is what I kind of mentioned earlier, where it says it can it can establish what a baseline is for a given window or time or season or you know month, you know during the day on a weekday in China, for instance. Um, you know if if something is strange during that time period, the profiler can kind of flag that as an anomaly, as as like you know three three standard deviations from normal for that um, for you, and uh, and then it does pcap storage, so people like full pcap. Um, so yeah, it does that. Uh, so I, I wrote support for this stuff in it. So like a lot of logs, but not all of them. We're gonna we're gonna be able to do more in the future. But like the big ones should be here. You know, SSH, SSL, weird log, con log, your notice, software radius. You know, whatever. And that's pretty much it. Against the trend, I only have this to look at. Actually, my one slide. Um, so I had to have my presentation um, up here from my GitHub repo. Last year, I came to BroCon and just kind of was trying to be an advocate for using BSD operating systems. And just a quick poll, I don't have much time. Anyone using FreeBSD, OpenBSD for anything? And anyone using it for Bro? So it's like that's, that's the numbers that were interesting to even get last year, like some people coming up and talking about the talk uh, that I gave. So took that information, then uh, submitted talks to the, the BSD CAN, which is the Canadian BSD conference, just kind of as like an overview of running all these network security tools across all the various BSD operating systems. And there, was, there seemed to be some interest, but 
uh, the thing I, I'm finding and been talking to people here is just trying to really get that advocacy where things like NetMap will work in the operating system. Something that would be a compelling reason for someone to even use FreeBSD because you can use a piece of commodity hardware, the Intel cards that you might have, and you'd be able to uh, have a high-performance network sensor for a low cost. That's still like a business reason for me that's important. Um, so it's pretty much just um, if anyone has any questions or any specifics or something that doesn't work on the FreeBSD like you're talking about, um, as I've talked to a couple people, that you'd like to see work or something that you think would be better if FreeBSD supported it. Anything? Nothing. Okay. Uh, if you saw this on, um, I think it was Mark's uh, laptop, I have a couple extra of these. If you really love BSD, you can come pick up these. Just look for me after the break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so this time I only have three slides, so I will not be taking a whole lot of, whole lot of your time. Um, so I'll quickly talk about uh, how we can detect the fake Google how we can detect the fake Google bots in uh, j just by analyzing logs in notice.log file. So I would like to mention that Google bot is a web crawler used by Google to um, crawl the websites and to index their data, whatever is available on the internet. And it uses specific characteristics to do that because, and it sticks with it because it does not want to be accidentally blocked by the websites who are not allowing some weird, um, uh, weird bots. So some of the characteristics that Google uses um, for the Google bots are, um, Cider. It uses 66.249/16 uh, uh, subnet for their uh, for all their crawlers. Uh, all the DNS names ends for for all the IP addresses that Google uses for the crawling of websites ends with the Google bo Googlebot.com. And actually, the complete DNS is like crawl. Uh, and hyphenated the uh, hyphenated IP address and then Google Googlebot.com and the user agents uh, Google. Um, Google makes sure that it includes Google bot in the user agent because a lot of times robots.txt file on the websites they usually allow every uh, they usually allow um, user agent having Google bot in them. So uh, it's very easy for uh, people to impersonate as Google bot if they really want to data mine your websites. So we were getting a lot of alerts. Uh, we were getting a lot of notices uh, for the scan uh, web crawler in our notice.log file. And we, when we were analyzing all the IP addresses who were actually mining our data from our websites, majority of them were like faking to be Google bots. And then we realized that they, uh, why they are doing that. So may, may, one, of the, one of the main reasons would be, uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, websites actually by default or uh, usually have trust in Google and they want to be indexed by Google so that they are searchable by users if they want uh, to, to, be able to, to, be, to be able to searchable by the user basically. So um, what we did was, uh, if you quickly go go through the notice.log file and you grab the scan uh, web crawler uh, note from the notice.log file, and you you just basically take all the uh, web crawlers having Google bot in their user agent. Uh, so the the format of the notice log file is uh, it act in the message actually it it tells you the user agent that was used by the web crawler. So if you just grab through the uh, case instance in case insensitive Google bot, it will show you all the uh, all the scanners using the. Um, user agent with, that has Google bot in the name in it. And you just uh, have to exclude the, uh, I know I have very uh, crude uh, side notation there for egrep-v, but you can uh, filter that out uh, more um, precisely. But for the, for, the, for the slide, it just worked. And then, uh, and then I'm, at, at lastly, I'm, uh, I'm awking it out. And then I'm, I'm printing out the uh, host name as well for that uh, corresponding IP. So you can see here that uh, some of the IPs, they are, um, they have some weird DNS name, like uh, the first one has like telica.com and the second one has like yourserver.de.com and they are using Google bot in their user agents and these, uh, these are getting reported as scan uh, web crawlers. So we, we directly block them on our um, model routers. Uh, the other way around, you can use the same technique to detect uh, some internal scanners that are faking to be Google bot. Majority of time, um, so, for, so for, for the previous search, if you just egrep uh, e all, all the IP ranges in your range, you can see the uh, internal IP addresses that are uh, faking to be Google bot. And majority of time, when we, uh, when we contact the users, they say that they are basically doing it for research purposes because we have like a lot of um, students taking data mining class and in their, in their project, they have to mine the data uh, across the internet and usually they get blocked. So that's why they use uh, Google bot in their, user, uh, in their username to, to not get blocked. Lastly, I will talk about the um, detecting shell shock attempts. It would be really um, 
interesting to know that even though even though shell shock attempt is a very uh, shell shock attack is a very old attack it's like almost three years old but we still see people trying it out on our websites so it's so it's a, so, so the quickest way to detect is is uh, in the http.log file if you grab through the uh, uh, field 13 which is the user agent um, user agent and you can just uh, search for command.exe or bin bin slash bash usually user agents do not contain those kind of Linux commands. And if you just grab through it, you can see that um, uh, different people are trying uh, to execute commands after that uh, magic string, which will, uh, if, if, that, if that complete uh, header can, is passed in the bash, uh, in the vulnerable bash uh, version, then that command will get executed after that magic string. So you can see that uh, people still are trying to uh, exploit that vulnerability if you have not updated to the, uh, latest version of bash or if, if your web servers are still running the vulnerable version of bash. So this is how we detect the shell shock attempts and these are all real and we, we just directly block those IP addresses at our border. So these are some quick picks I just wanted to share that these are the these are some things that you can directly take away from the log files without doing any kind of magic on top of bro. So that's it. Okay, so how many people know what ESNet is? No, no, he does. Okay, several people do. It's, it's a very large uh, service provider style network that's purpose built for moving around huge data sets. It's at this point international. So it's not a typical network that would, ha it doesn't have a border, right? It has, everything is a border uh, because it's a carrier style network. So how do you, how do you creatively watch traffic on that and leverage the, extensive amount of data that you're collecting all the instrumentation and whatnot for uh you know f for using it in a security style manner um it's it's you know one would think yeah you could probably do that but it's actually kind of hard to do so you can't just put a bro sensor all over the place and and monitor in by 100 gigs of traffic that exist all over europe and the united states it's it's uh operationally and, and uh cost prohibitive so one of the things we decided to do was to, and this is what it's like, it's like drinking from the fire hose. Um, we decided to start taking all of this data that we were already collecting, like flow data, syslog data, uh, all, uh, all of the information that we already had, and then prototype using uh, strategically placed bro sensors to generate alarms. And what those alarms would be, would be an Intel feed, for then going back and looking at the existing data that we already had and trying to find any kind of correlation or any kind of matching across our entire ecosystem. Um, it turns out that's actually kind of hard to do. So we've been working on it for almost two years now and we have a functional prototype uh, that's currently uh, leveraging the, the, the listed uh, data sources there uh, for correlation along with bro alarms uh, so, uh, let's say, for example, we get a, uh, an alarm on one of our bro sensors. Uh, we go back and we look through syslog to see if there's anything related across our entire backbone. We look at the NetFlow data, which tends to be the richest amount of information that we're able to uh, correlate with. Uh, and then one of the things that we decided to do, which I think is fairly unique, is that we start looking at what the routing topology is through the network to find out if that potential nefarious traffic may be causing other problems that are manifesting in different ways that may not necessarily look like security events but are the symptom of some kind of security event like say a, a core router having uh, an interface pegged or something like that that you know it just looks like a lot of traffic but it's really caused by this denial of service that happens to be taking this topological path through our network um so that, that ended up being fairly interesting. And so we decided to keep working on it and keep working on it and using uh, you know, more and more data feeds uh, to, to enrich it. Um, we eventually want to add this uh, as a production service that protects all, all of the infrastructure that ESNet runs, so all the core routers and all of the, all the little bits and pieces that allow that to function and be managed and remote pops all over the world. Uh, and then potentially offer that as an opt-in service uh, for connectors or sites that might use us as a, as a transit network, um, you know, in the future as an aspirational goal. Um, but I think the takeaway from this is that, you know, this is, this is a, a, a thing that is not just useful for service providers. It's any, 
any big network that already has this wealth of data can really take advantage of this. Um, and here's some of the things that it allows us to do, right? We can correlate things for targeted attacks, which are hard to find, especially on geographically diverse networks, smaller DDoSs, volumetric attacks, um, all kinds of interesting things that don't really have a great mechanism for getting accomplished in this type of environment. Um, so this is essentially what it looks like uh, in, in every pop, in every transit pop, there will exist this set of systems with the green circles uh, very likely being co-located in, in data centers. Um, attacker comes in, does bad things, some alarm gets tripped, and then we go back, correlate, see if it happens anywhere else, and then we filter it across all of the, the ingress points. Uh, that's it in a very small nutshell. Um, so if anybody has any other questions about this, I know I'm probably treading over my time, but uh, you know, my email address is at the bottom. And also we're hiring. So <laughs> if you know good developers or good network engineers, I'm going to use this time to pitch. Uh, talk to me uh, about any of these things uh, after I'll be around. Hello. Uh, I'm an engineer at Packet Sled. My name's Leo. I'm um, going to have to be brief with this overview, but I work on a lot of the internals of, of the Bro kernel um, to customize for our needs at Packet Sled, and we've made a lot of really significant changes over the last year, um, significant enough to, we think, stand on their own feet and share with the community. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the things we've done. Uh, so some of the challenges that motivated what we've done uh, our own pain points, uh, particularly bro scripts are expensive. We love writing bro scripts. We have dozens, maybe hundreds of detections, but they start to add up. Um, and we needed to find a solution to that. Uh, we also have some other customer use cases, like sometimes for flows, you know, there's only so many protocol analyzers we have, but there's so many protocols. Um, sometimes we want more than just the con log, and we want to get those interesting uh, flows that other IDSs miss, including Bro. And then we just have a long-term vision that we want our sensors to do more on the same hardware, which is very much in line with the core Bro team. Uh, so our options, compile Bro script and optimize the executables. We looked at this option. Um, the way Bro script is distributed across the kernel, it would be very complex, and it also doesn't solve one of the problems we want to address is we don't like restarting Bro, losing all of our state, our long-running flows. Uh, we want to run these scripts dynamically without restarting a sensor. So we looked at high-performance alternatives. Um, there's BIFs, bin packs, um, Bro plugins. That's what we use for our analyzers and stuff. Those are great. But again, they don't solve the dynamic problem, and they're also just less accessible to our analysts, to our customers who can modify our stuff on our sensor management framework. Uh, so what we came up with was Luajit, which is kind of designed to be integrated in this way. Um, it's a high-performance, just-in-time compiler, uses a C API, and it gets faster as it runs. Um, so we decided to explore this more. Uh, so the outcomes of these challenges, we forked from Bro 2.5, and we introduced an alternative scripting framework that's built with Lua scripts, uh, similar to Suricata. Um, we added a library to support that, so you can do anything with a Lua script that you can do with a Bro script, and you can load them dynamically. Um, we also made some changes in how we handle and generate metadata for unidentified flows. Um, and we made some just generic improvements and customizations for what we do. Uh, so here's kind of an overview of the Lua manager. Um, it, it intercepts events from the various sources within the Bro kernel that will generate them, analyzers, uh, the net run loop, etc. And it creates a sandbox. Luajit owns the actual script context for Lua scripts that we add. And you can see that we can add a script by putting it in a certain folder dynamically. We can load a script with a Bro instance that's already running. Um, it will run the events. And if a Lua script fails, if there's an error, um, it actually is sandboxed it will you know, put some error output and uh, unload it without crashing Bro. So these are two things that are big advantages for us. And we also have this Bro library, which uh, you can ask us about later after the talks, uh, which pretty much allows you to call any Bro biff or uh, any Bro function even, or generate any event from a Lua script. So basically, you can do anything that a Bro script can do, but we also have the advantage of this, you know, Lua is a well-supported language. There's all these third-party integrations, libraries, et cetera. 
Um, then we also added analyzers of last resort. This was simpler from an implementation perspective, but it's really useful for what we do. So right now, um, you know, we have all of these analyzers that can attach, so you could either have a UDP or TCP analyzer attaching, and then it has these children analyzers that will attach if you, um, if you, if you uh, pass the signature or whatnot. But if no children have attached to a certain flow, it's some unknown protocol, and typically, because we have an SSL analyzer, they're typically plain text protocols, so we want to look at those still. So we create a UDP and TCP logs. We collect entropy, we measure the ASCII, and we log interesting excerpts from the flow and put them in this log. And when you look at it, you find some really interesting things that wouldn't get logged by normal analyzers, but are more interesting than just to warrant a single con log entry. Uh, so some other additions, you know, um, don't have a lot of time to go over them, but we made some optimizations, like in the net run loop, for example, we optimized for maximum load. Uh, with preprocessor branch prediction macros. So, you know, we always assume there's a packet ready. Uh, we always assume it's unlikely that we're about to get a fatal error. And we actually saw a pretty uh, decent 3% speed up with this change alone. Um, so this is something we want to apply to other parts of Bro. Um, and then there's the things I already mentioned, and there's the dong. Uh, so I'll pass this off to uh, Aaron. My name is Aaron Eppert. I'm the Director of Engineering at Packet Sled. Uh, Leo and I work together on our sensor framework. So this is the follow-on to his talk. It's the natural progression of it. So what I want you, everybody to think as I go through here is uh, some of these questions. How many of you have modified Bro internally? Just versus downlight? That's a decent number. Okay. Are you productizing it? Are you packaging it up? Are you selling it? Are you putting it on the shelf to put it out there? Number? Okay. What's your, if, you're not, if you're not actually doing that, what's your sustainability model look like? So how are you managing, how are you dealing with it? How are you dealing with the times? It's probably not your primary project. If it's not something you're productizing and selling, you obviously are buying time away from something else. So how are you dealing with that internally? That's, you don't have to answer it now, we can talk about it later, but that's something to keep in, consider, keep in mind as we go through talking the rest. So the challenges around anything, obviously internal, I don't care where you are, there's political issues. Um, if we can, we can't release. We should, we should release things. We, we can't for IP reasons. We can't for, it's classified, you know, if you're in the government spaces. Uh, there's a number of reasons. You have issues with commits. So you want to, you want to participate. You want to commit code. You want to send it back. But you still, you go back to that first bullet point. It's political reasons. You can't. You want to, but you can't. You have to clear a couple hurdles. Just, it's a circular uh, pain loop. And then you, you have this issue of, you know, are you going to corrupt an open source project by committing something? I know that sounds a little bit weird because you're contributing, but if you're actually changing the tenor of that project because of a single commit or, you know, group of commits, that's usually bad. You usually don't want to try to do that. And then as a vendor, so, you know, those are, you know, packagizing, um, productizing Bro and selling it in some capacity or on top of, you know, things on top of Bro. You have a risk as a vendor of putting code out there. What's that do to actually paying your bills, paying your employees, expanding your business, expanding your employees? You have an issue there. However, with that all being said, you know, we packet said we, we built on top of Bro. We've, we've, as Leo, you know, wonderfully showed you some of the things we have actually extended in Bro. We would like to share, we would like to share this back. We've benefited from Bro. All of us can thank the core team for Bro existing period. We want to contribute this back, but because of the previous side of the challenges, we need to have a, you know, a dialogue. We feel like the, the others in the room that would like to do the same, a dialogue on what that really needs to look like. And it's, it's really, it's wonderfully simple. I wish the world was as simple. Say, let's commit. You know, let's push that back in. You can't always do that. Um, so we just need to discuss that. You know, those include, obviously, Lua, the analyzer of last resort, some optimizations we've done, bug fixes otherwise. Uh, we have a slew of, of analyzers. We like to start releasing over time. I mean, we benefit from that, obviously, as it's out there. We have other maintainers, other eyes. Those lo lovely corner cases get found and fixed. Um, we can test all we want on our networks, on our data, on our customers' networks, uh, and we still don't always find all the little nuances. So that's always advantageous. So what we're asking is, you know, you know a broke community, there is one that always exists, but what, what else can be done? Um, it's a vendor and consumer consortium with that, you know, coming together to figure out how to actually solve some of these problems and decide moving forward on how we can fix some of these things or, or at least talk about them. Um, 
and then a consensus roadmap where we balance out vendor wants and consumer needs. Because obviously, if you're not selling Bro, you're more of a consumer side of it. But if you are selling Bro, you have your own goals because we all, while well, there's several companies out here raise their hands, we all have different uses and how we're actually using Bro for you know, our customers' benefits. And then, of course, with that comes the maintainers and the committers, you know, the folks that are actually doing the work, uh, getting it released and getting it, you know, pull requests taken care of. How do we balance their time, their pain, with all the above? And that's the dialogue we like to start. I mean, we start now. Obviously, don't have a lot of time, but visit us after. Otherwise, you know, um, I'm available. I'm, I'm around here the rest of the week. Uh, otherwise, Twitter and email. And I just look forward to just kind of starting up this dialogue to figure out how this can be done, solve all these problems. Thank you. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Jan and I will talk about the Bro LogNorm plugin, um, which is uh, just uh, like that Biff plugin Robin was talking about. Um, and yeah, what it's uh, about, uh, I was one day brainstorming with uh, Seth and um, he told me, wouldn't it be cool to pass syslog messages inside of Bro? Um, and so we came up with that idea to use uh, liblog norm, which uh, came up in the context of uh, our syslog. And um, what it does, it just applies uh, rules like that uh, orange one here um, to uh, log lines. Um, and yeah, that rule has here a tag um, called greeting and um, yeah, it expects an hello and then a variable called who, which is a word. And um, then applied to a log line, it just generates JSON. Um, and now the idea is um, for that JSON to convert that into a Bro event and handle that inside of Bro. Um, and the implementation is, um, yeah, we, I just build a plugin um, offering a new OPAC type that's um, just a type like a Bloom filter. Um, and yeah, put a script land interface around it for easy usage. So how would that look like? Um, to set up um, that kind of thing, you just uh, load the bro log norm plugin and you define a rule file. And um, there in the comment, you can see that's the rule file, just the same rule with the greeting. And the only thing you have to do now is just define an event handler for that uh, greetings thing. And um, that receives the parameter uh, who, which is the string. Um, and then you can just handle that log line. Um, and there's also an event for unpassed log lines. So in case um, you have a log line that's no match for a rule, um, you can handle that too. Um, and um, yeah, how to, to use that inside of log, how, uh, in row, how to get logs uh, into it. You can just call the normalize or there's a, a read logs, um, which um, yeah, just uses the input framework. Um, to yeah, read just plain files, or you can just load the read syslog, which uses that for syslog. So now the question is, uh, what are the use cases? So actually, I don't know, because I think if you have uh, syslog traffic, um, then you probably have a syslog infrastructure and you're doing that anyway. Um, but at least it was fun to write that plugin and uh, it may serve as an example um, to how that can be used, uh, the, the OPAC type stuff and so on. Uh, and if you want to have a look at the source code, it's on GitHub or you can just drop me a mail. Thanks. Um, sorry, I did not fully understand the question, so I cannot rephrase it. But there, there's a use case, so somebody already found a use case. <laughs> yeah, so the comment is that the use case is uh, like just feed an SSH log into Bro, and then you can actually have a username for an SSH connection, so Bro already sees the connection record. Okay, so the idea is to feed an SSH logs into Bro, and then correlate the usernames with the uh, traffic you see with Bro. So. Yeah, obviously there are some use cases. So feel free uh, to use that plugin. <laughs>